Hi. So today we're going to talk a little bit about juries and specifically, uh, hopefully you have uh, read the material on Canvas about how juries operate, um, what they do, the voir dire process, that sort of thing, kind of the mechanics of juries. Um, so this is this particular lecture is going to take kind of a deep dive into the way that juror characteristics affect both individual and group decision making. So remember that uh, voir dire or voir dire as people in Texas call it, uh, is this process of asking questions of potential jurors and determining whether they are appropriate to sit on the jury. So during this questioning process, uh, the attorneys or sometimes even the judge will ask to dismiss a juror for cause, meaning that there's something about the juror's situation that means that they probably can't be unbiased. Uh, for example, they know one of the witnesses, or it's a medical malpractice case and one of them is a doctor, right? That could be problematic. So, um, or, or maybe they've heard a lot about the trial in uh, the media and they've already made up their mind. That is a big one. Um, the rest of the, the voir dire process is devoted to sort of teasing out information about the jurors that the attorneys can then use to exercise what are called peremptory challenges. And this is really truly an art form. The way that attorneys have sometimes kind of seemingly bizarre uh, rules that they use when selecting jurors. For example, when uh, I actually served on a jury at one point, and one of the attorneys, one of his questions was, do you have any bumper stickers on your car? And interestingly, he wasn't interested in what the bumper sticker said. Um, instead, his position was that if you had bumper stickers on your car, that suggested that you held on to ideas and that you sort of deeply, um, you possessed some very deep-seated beliefs and you weren't necessarily as flexible as he wanted you to be as a potential juror. Um, a friend of mine worked for the, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia, which prosecutes uh, sort of the types of crimes that would be state crimes anyplace else, uh, things like assaults and drug possession cases and that and that sort of thing and uh, she told me that they had a number of uh, uh, rules that you didn't even have to ask a question to know which jurors you were going to dismiss but any juror who was wearing little round John Lennon glasses was out and any potential juror who was wearing Birkenstocks was out and any potential juror who was carrying a backpack was out. Um, the, those were people they wanted to dismiss with peremptory challenges because the perception was that these were going to be more liberal people, people who might be overly sympathetic to the position of a criminal defendant. One way that attorneys uh, sort of try to master this art form is by hiring jury consultants. Uh, this is an actual job you can have. Uh, a lot of them have degrees in psychology. Um, sometimes, some of them also have do law degrees, uh, degrees in sociology, etc. And um, jury consultants do a whole host of things. A, a good jury consultant firm will uh, do surveys uh, within a community where a trial is going to take place to get a sense of uh, kind of the temperature of the community. Is this a community that's just sick to death of crime? Uh, is this a community that really supports uh, free enterprise and business? Is this a uh, community that has uh, strong feelings about environmentalism? All sorts of things that might affect the beliefs of the jury pool. Um, they will also actually investigate individual jurors. 
So once the attorneys are provided with a list of jurors by the, the court, uh, some consultants will actually go out and they will find these jurors on social media, for example, and see what sorts of things they've posted. Or they will uh, go and talk to neighbors of these jurors to find out more about them. They will also help the attorneys draft questions, come up with the questions that they want to use during the jury selection process. They will help prepare witnesses. Uh, once the jury consultant knows something about the jury and about the individual jurors, uh, then the jury consultant can help the witness appeal to those jurors. Like, you really need to emphasize the fact that you're a mom because juror number seven has a soft spot for moms, right? things like that. They will also uh, conduct post-trial interviews. This doesn't help your client unless, of course, the case uh, has hung uh, and you're potentially going to have to have a second trial. Uh, but it's very helpful for the attorneys to find out after the uh, fact what sorts of arguments worked with the jurors, what sorts of arguments didn't work, um, how the jurors perceived uh, the attorneys themselves, helps the attorneys become more appealing to juries in the future. Uh, so jury consultants are expensive. Uh, typically, they charge by the hour, and we're talking about $250 an hour, which is a pretty substantial fee. And usually, if you use a jury consultant for a, uh, a, a full trial, um, you're looking at spending at least $10,000, and sometimes way more than that, um, up to a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, if you have a very wealthy criminal defendant, uh, as your client, they might be happy to spend that money. Uh, but also, uh, jur jury consultants work in civil cases as well, and sometimes the money involved in those cases is extraordinarily big. So can we really predict how jurors are going to behave uh, based on their answers to some of these questions? Are there patterns that we can identify? Um, there is a group of researchers named Hasty, Penrod, and Pennington who have done extensive research on jurors. And um, what they have found, and this is just sort of summarizing uh, a number of their studies, they have found that um, unemployed and retired jurors tend to be more defense-oriented. So in other words, people with jobs tend to be more prosecution-oriented. Um, we're not really 100% certain why that is. It may make sense, for example, that unemployed people are more sympathetic to the underdog, to the little guy, the criminal defendant. But why retired jurors would feel that way is, is, is a little bit unclear. Um, we do know that women tend to be a little bit more defense-oriented than men. Um, that's on average, it's certainly not across the board, but on average. Um, what's more, we know that if a juror has sat on a previous criminal case, right, so if they have experience as a juror in a criminal proceeding, they are much more likely to be uh, prosecution oriented. They're much more likely to believe that the defendant is guilty which is, again, a very interesting finding. And that's a, a question that's pretty simple to ask. Um, most of what Hasty, Penrod, and Pennington find, though, is that it's harder to predict which side a juror is going to choose. But rather, we can detect patterns in the way that jurors participate. Uh, so, for example, uh, the, these researchers have done a number of mock juries and so they will do a mock case and they'll have this mock jury sit in a room together and uh, they'll videotape the, the proceedings, the jury deliberations, and then they will analyze who spoke, how often, what did they say, that sort of thing. And what they find is that uh, more educated jurors tend to participate more during deliberations, so they, they talk more. Um, and in fact, they do tend to have a better recall of the evidence. They're less likely to make factual errors when they uh, sort of report back or talk about 
evidentiary issues. Um, jurors who are in high status occupations, people like doctors, lawyers, CEOs, um, you know, school principals, that sort of thing, they tend to also talk more during deliberations. They play a, a bigger role. They're also more likely to uh, be chosen as the jury foreperson. Um, men and women behave very differently in um, jury proceedings. Specifically, men are more likely than women to talk about uh, facts, issue, legal issues, and organizational matters. So they're more likely to talk, want to talk about, for example, um, how the jury itself is going to operate, uh, how they're going to select a foreperson, how they're going to take an initial vote, those sorts of things. Um, the men are also more likely to talk about, um, you know, disputed issues of fact, like um, whether or not the gun that was recovered was actually the murder weapon. Whereas women tend to be a little bit more likely to talk about the um, content of what the witnesses said and the witnesses' demeanor and sort of engaging in that kind of social analysis. Um, we also know that uh, age plays an important part in determining which jurors talk during deliberations. Uh, jurors between the ages of 34 and 57, so sort of middle-aged jurors, are more likely to talk than younger people or older people. Um, again, we're not 100% certain why that is, it may be the same sort of dynamic that causes people um, who are more educated and in higher prestige jobs to talk. That there may be something about being either older or younger that makes you feel more intimidated by the people around you or less secure in your own beliefs or something. We just don't really know. Um, older jurors, uh, and you know, we talk, uh, the Canvas page before this talks about the fact that there are a lot of older jurors. Right? There are a lot of older jurors because older jurors are less likely to have work and family obligations that prevent them from sitting on the jury, that make it a hardship for them to sit on the jury. Um, older jurors, and here uh, they define older as being over 57, a number that is creeping up faster and faster for me, um, that older jurors actually take the deliberations more seriously. They're more likely to want to prolong the conversation, to continue to ask questions, um, but at the same time, they are more likely to get facts wrong. They're more likely to, to recall information inaccurately, um, which, is, which is potentially problematic. You will recall from the, the Canvas page that pettit juries, juries that are deciding the outcome of an actual trial, um, use different decision rules. So in civil cases, many, um, um, many states uh, use a majority rule for civil cases. So as soon as more than half of the jurors decide one particular direction or the other, then the decision is made. In criminal law, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in criminal law for all non-petty offenses, so anything above a petty misdemeanor, if you have a jury trial, the jury must be unanimous. Um, um, and, and that is now actually the law uh, that is a requirement of the Constitution and it applies to the states as well as the federal government. So even in states that had uh, something other than unanimity rules before 2020, now they all have to have uh, unanimous jury decision-making rules. Um, so Hasty Penrod and Pennington also have done research on the implications of having a un unanimity rule as opposed to a majority rule for juries. Um, the drawback to unanimity is not surprising, um, and that is that you're more likely to end up with a jury that can't make a decision uh, because you know, if everyone has to agree, 
everyone has to agree on guilt for a specific crime, has to agree on every single element of a specific crime, you're far more likely to end up with you know, one, two, three people who just aren't on the same page as everybody else. If you have a majority rule, that doesn't matter. But when there's a unanimity rule, that means that you have a mistrial and you potentially have to try the case all over again. That is a big bummer, right? That is an expensive and time-consuming process. Um, it's also emotionally very difficult for witnesses and victims. Um, so we, we would really rather not have hung juries. However, unanimity rules also tend to improve the quality of the deliberation um, in two ways. One is that when there's a unanimity rule, because every juror's vote matters, every juror has to be on board with the final decision, there is greater equality of participation. In other words, all of the jurors generally get to talk. This is really important because one of the reasons that we admire the jury process, that we think that juries are good, is that juries are an opportunity to bring lots of different perspectives to bear on a single problem, right? Two heads are better than one. Twelve heads are better than two. We like this. And uh, you don't get that benefit of varying perspectives if some people sit quietly and don't share their perspective. So having greater quality of, of participation is definitely a benefit. Um, the researchers also found that when there's a unanimity rule, there tends to simply be more discussion. Not just that it's equally distributed among the people who are present, but in fact there is simply more of it um, and a lot more detail with respect to the way in which uh, the jurors talk about the evidence. So the quality of the conversation is different in a good way. Um, the Bornstein and Green article that you read looks at whether juries get it right. Do we really want a group of lay people to decide these important legal issues? Um, Think of it this way. Uh, when I was working in the court system, we had a case that involved reinsurance. You probably don't know what reinsurance is. I certainly did not know what it was until that particular case. Um, but basically what it is, is you take out an insurance policy with, say, State Farm. State Farm doesn't want to own all of that risk. So they sell some of that risk to somebody else. Um, <laughs> and that's called reinsurance. So somebody's going to pay your insurer and then your insurer is going to pay you for part of your damages. Um, so this was, a, this was a case that involved reinsurance of a self-insured school district in Minnesota that suffered a fire. Oh boy. Um, it was so technical, um, you know, it had to do with where the comma placement was in a contract, and this was dry, dry stuff. And we had a real concern that the jury was going to sleep through this case. Um, it was not exciting and it was very long and it was required a tremendous attention to detail in order just to follow what was happening, much less make a decision about it. Um, we really weren't sure whether the jury was up to it. As it turned out, they were. And um, we knew from the, the quality of questions they asked after they had delivered their verdict that they actually did understand what was going on in the case. But you can see why people might be concerned that uh, for very long cases, very complicated cases, emotionally charged cases, uh, you know, cases involving the murder of a child, for example, do you really want 12 people who 
don't do this for a living to be making these decisions. So we would like to know if jurors get it right. Well, that's hard to know, of course, particularly in criminal cases, because um, in a criminal case, we don't necessarily know what the right answer is. We do when it's law and order, but in real life, we don't know whether a convicted person really is guilty or not. Um, we just, that's not something we can guess. So what Bornstein and Green do is they kind of try to come at this issue of accuracy from a number of different indirect angles. One thing they look at is, do jurors understand what they heard in a case? And uh, what they find is that the answer is often no. <laughs> that jurors have often poor recall of what happened in the case. Um, and more importantly, they don't understand what happened. They don't necessarily understand the importance of particular pieces of evidence. They don't know why they listened to that witness. They don't know why that person was called to testify. They don't understand why the attorneys asked the questions that they asked. So sort of building a picture of what happened um, you know, outside of the courtroom, it, it, it's very difficult. Um, another question or another sort of facet of juror performance that Bornstein and Green look at is whether jurors are relying on the correct evidence. Um, remember when we talked about uh, evidentiary issues in the first half of the semester, we talked about the fact that uh, sometimes evidence comes in, right? A, a, an attorney asks a question and the witness answers the question and there's an objection, right? That's hearsay. Um, when that happens, sometimes the, jur the jury is told you need to disregard what that person just said. Um, Bornstein and Green ask, uh, try to figure out whether jurors are using that inappropriate evidence or not. And they find that jurors are actually pretty good at only using the evidence they're supposed to use. And anything they've been told to disregard, at least outwardly, they disregard it. Um, they don't admit to using it. They don't admit to thinking about it. Another way that Bornstein and Green attempt to measure jury performance is by looking at whether a judge hearing the case, so someone who's an expert um, who has sat in on many, many, many cases, whether a judge reaches the same decision as the jury. And um, this is probably a good sign uh, that judges agree with jury verdicts about 75 to 80 percent of the time. Now, of course, that means that in 20 to 25 percent of the time, they don't. They think the jury gets it wrong. But, uh, you know, more often than not, the judge who we would hope would have some special insight, the judge um, agrees with the jury. And this is, I think, probably the most interesting finding to me of the Bornstein and Green research. And that is that in 90% of the trials, the position that's favored by the majority at the beginning of deliberations ends up as the jury's verdict. So in other words, let's say you have a, a, a murder trial and the jury retires and they start to deliberate. Often one of the very first things a jury will do is take an a anonymous vote, right? They'll, they'll take a, an initial vote just to see where, you know, is it close, is it not close, what? Um, and what we find is that most of the time, if a majority of jurors believe that that defendant is guilty before deliberation, the jury turn, returns a guilty verdict and vice versa. If a majority believe that the defendant is not guilty before any deliberation, the jury ends up acquitting. Um, this is particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that it casts some doubt on whether unanimity really matters, right? If we end up with the same result, if we can walk to the back of the courtroom, take a majority vote, and that's what we're going to get to, why make the jury deliberate all that time? 
just to reach the unanimous, unanimous decision? Um, there's an answer to that. <laughs> um, what a, the, I think the answer to that, I think the reason that it is still appropriate to go through the process of developing a unanimous um, verdict is that procedure matters and that deliberation matters. We don't want 12 people to make 12 independent decisions without any deliberation. Even if the deliberation only changes the outcome in 10% of the cases, that 10% is important, right? Uh, that, you know, that's 10 out of 100 people who are acquitted instead of convicted or convicted instead of acquitted. That, that's actually pretty important. Um, you know, 90% sounds overwhelmingly like deliberation doesn't give us anything. It doesn't add anything to the process. But again, I think the simple fact of deliberation makes the proceeding seem more fair, makes it more likely that people will accept the verdict. That by itself is important, but it also, that deliberation does change the outcome in 10% of cases. And that, you know, that's a big deal. If you're a criminal defendant, 10% chance is better than a 0% chance. Um, so even though we find that um, the deliberative process doesn't seem to have a tremendous practical effect on the outcome, um, I think it is still nevertheless quite valuable. All right, that's it.